firearms instructors on the range often talk about scanning for threats after a course of fire. This is a good course of action for a variety of reasons, but that's not the topic of today's video. We're going to talk about the types of threats people don't generally think of when they're scanning for threats. Most people, when you tell them to scan for threats at the end of a course of fire, we're in that mindset of ballistic threats, of people threats, threats like this, your typical bad guy with a gun. But there's lots of other things that we need to take into account that should be taken into account when we decide how we're going to scan, how we train people to scan for threats, and when we do our practice on our own. All right, man, take a seat, quick look. Ordinarily, we'd start with uh, orientation of the car here, but we got calls pending, and we got to get to them. So, we're rolling. We're going to have to learn on the way. All right, today... I so I'm taking a little break today from actual training to do a little training for you all. Something came up in a rifle class I was doing today, and it seemed to throw a few people for a loop, so we're going to discuss it here. A lot of times we talk about scanning for threats, and people think about the bad guy with a gun type threats. Everybody's kind of stuck when they're on a square range about ballistic threats, but we have to think about the 360 degree world that we're actually working in every day. And ballistic threats aren't the only type of threats that we have. In fact, they're not even really the primary type. And post a shooting incident, uh, when we train for what we're looking for, when we're scanning at the end of our course of fire, we have to think about all of the different threats that might present themselves. So there's three things that I want to talk about today. Uh, the first one is when we scan for threats, are we giving the scan enough time to pick up all of the different types of non-ballistic threats that might be coming at us? And the non, maybe not even the, the non-ballistic threats, but the non-people threats that might be coming at us. For instance, at the start of a critical incident, it's not unusual for guys to pull up, leap out of their car, throw it in park, and not make it all the way in a park, and so the car is still rolling. You see this happen all the time. I mean, it's happened to me, it's happened to most people that I know. When you get on a scene and you're either the first officer or the second or third officer coming on scene. You're in a hurry to get out of the car and get on with business. And you throw the car in park and sometimes the cars just don't, uh, they don't listen to our directions the way they should. And we end up getting out and that car is still rolling forward. So we get done with a course of fire. When we're scanning around, if we're doing and then holstering up, is this enough time to see a car moving? The problem with cars moving is when they're in idle, they're not always moving fast. So a quick look at the car, it might look stationary because you're not watching it long enough to see if the car is still moving. The second issue is with non-ballistic threats from people who are posing a threat to us, but they're not posing the type of threat to us that would require a lethal force response. For instance, let's say you're in a house and it's for a domestic and you end up having an officer involved shooting. Now, the fact that you're in someone's house and it's a domestic, the person that, that you might have just shot, all of their family is around you. What happens if an unarmed family member starts charging at you? Are you gonna shoot that person because your gun's out or would it be better to holster that pistol back up and be able to address that threat? And we have to think about these things when we're on the range and we're scanning for threats. We need to slow down and scan enough so that we can see what's actually going on and we have to integrate other skills into it Oftentimes you hear it said by firearms instructors, we're in no rush to holster up. Well, most of the time that might be the case, but if we've got an unarmed person that's charging at us because we just shot their loved one, we don't necessarily want to shoot that person. I don't want to shoot anyone, to be honest with you. So I don't think it's unreasonable to practice when we're scanning for threats, holstering up in a hurry and, retain, and putting the retention devices on our holster so that way we can address other types of non-ballistic threats, non-lethal threats that are going to occur in our environment. Finally, I want to talk about lethal ballistic threats that aren't necessarily the bad guy's gun. Oftentimes, when we arrive onto a scene, you might be the first or second officer, and so you take a tactical position that's closer to the scene. The third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh wave, depending on how large the critical incident becomes, might take positions further out. So you have a problem where if you take a knee behind some cover, let's say you take a knee behind some cover, and you're shooting over the top of an automobile, but there's somebody maybe... 20 yards back that was shooting over the top of their automobile, it's higher and further away. They never even saw you. You take your shots, you do your quick scans and you get up, you might be walking directly into the path of their bullet. And that's not somewhere any of us want to be. We also have to think at 
when we're doing our range training about the realities of life post a situation on the street. In reality, are we going to scan and then if we find no threats, immediately holster up? Think about that. Think about the way you've been trained in scenarios and what your policy says. Does your policy tell you to, after you fired on a lethal threat, to then scan the area and holster up? Are we just doing that for the range because we have to holster up eventually? Or should we start treating, at least in a portion of our firearms training, that lethal threat the way we actually would treat a lethal threat in real life? How much more useful would our training be if we engaged that threat on the range and then had to hold on it and call for EMS and call for a supervisor immediately afterward and call for additional units to then clear the area. Even if we're just doing it in a cursory manner with our own practice and not just, not entirely, not the entirety of the training that we have on a range training day, how much more helpful is that than getting into the habit of firing, checking our area, and then holstering up? So we have to think about these things when we're doing our scans and we need to think about how we can train to better address all of these different types of threats that we might have post a critical incident, post an officer involved shooting. So think about that when you do your training. I'm not gonna tell you I have all the solutions that you need to do a 360 degree turn or that you have to look directly behind you and look three seconds or that you shouldn't do a quick check and then a slower check before you holster. But our actions as usual every day post a critical incident, post an officer involved shooting, have to be dictated by the totality of the circumstances that we find ourselves faced with. We can't get into mantras and just follow those mantras without thinking. Law enforcement is a thinking man sport, a thinking woman sport, and that's how we have to look at our firearms training. If you like content like this, please like, subscribe, and share to whatever social media source you use. If you like this content, you get something out of it. People that you work with get something out of it, and you appreciate it for that purpose. You use it for training, or if you like the content that I'm putting forward to the public and the message that it sends about law enforcement, please consider checking out my Patreon channel and making a small donation on a monthly basis. It would really help me out. It would allow me to buy better equipment, spend more time on this, and less time working security side jobs so that I can bring you more of the content that you like and, and shines a positive light on the law enforcement in general. Channel updates will be after the credits, and you guys be safe out there. Well, now if you like that video, go ahead and subscribe because there's a whole lot more to come. As soon as I uh, finish up these calls, go 10-8. County 291. So coming up in the immediate future, we've got the Kansas City Badge Placement Study. I am almost done with that. It's it's a lot of rendering, you'd be amazed. And also, I was asked by an 11-year-old subscriber named Enan Mooney. He Hopefully, I'm saying that right. He was really insistent that I give him a shout-out, and he's been with the channel since I had like 12 subscribers. Uh, I don't know what a shout-out really is because I'm too old and don't understand the internet that well, but hopefully that gets him excited. We'll see you guys next week. You guys be safe.